Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Genesis 34. This is one of those chapters that reminds us that God's word does not downplay or ignore the depravity of man. At times in Scripture, we gain insight into the recesses of man's wicked heart, and it's not pretty. And that's what we have here today. It was probably about six years ago, I taught through the book of Genesis to our youth on Wednesday nights, and while not shying away from anything revealed in the scriptures, there were times where I would tell the young people to ask their parents to further explain some of these things if they had questions. And I echo that sentiment this morning. We must not shy away from teaching our children the truth about the world in which we live, but we must do so in an age-appropriate manner. So parents, I leave that to you as you've been charged in Scripture to raise them up in the ways of God. And I bring this also to your attention because Genesis 34 to put it in no better terms, is really an R-rated passage. Um, It provides us, as I said, a glimpse into the recesses of man's wicked heart. This passage reveals to us some of the wicked manifestations that come out of man's wicked heart. Mark 7, Jesus says, For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, Adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and they defile a a person. And we will see some of these evil things in Genesis 34. We'll see sexual immorality, evil thoughts, murder, wickedness, covetousness, deceit, So while this is a mature passage of Scripture, this passage is not given to us. God did not give it to us to gratify sensual cravings as Hollywood does. Hollywood glorifies evil to gratify sensual cravings. That is not the way the Bible presents these things to us. This passage was given up to us to show us the depravity of man and the unfathomable nature of man. Of God's grace. That said, I do not intend to present the details from an R rated approach. I will allude to the wicked acts that we see here in more general terms out of respect for young ears, but neither will I shy away from any of the truths we learn in this passage. So, with that introduction, I'm sure some of you are nervous while others of you are excited. Um, <laughs> So let's go ahead and read Genesis 34, and then I'll pray before we go any further. So Genesis 34, verse 1. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he seized her and lay with her and humiliated her. And his soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this girl for my wife. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled his daughter Dinah, but his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. The sons of Jacob had come in from the field as soon as they heard of it, And the men were indignant and very angry because he had done an outrageous thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, for such a thing must not be done. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him to be his wife. Make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. You shall dwell with us, and the land shall be open to you. Dwell and trade in it, and get property in it. Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, Let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you say to me, I will give. 
Ask me for as great a bride price and gift as you will, and I will give whatever you say to me. Only give me the young woman to be my wife. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully because he had defiled their sister Dinah. They said to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we agree with you that you will become as we are by every male among you being circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters to ourselves, and we will dwell with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we will be gone. Their words pleased Hamor and Hamor's son Shechem. And the young man did not delay to do the thing, because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. Now he was the most honored of all his father's house. So Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city, saying, These men are at peace with us. Let them dwell in the land and trade in it. For behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters as wives, and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will the men agree to dwell with us to become one people. When every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised, will not their livestock, their property, and all their beasts be ours? Only let us agree with them, and they will dwell with us. And all who went out of the gate of his city listened to Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. On the third day, when they were sore, Two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys and whatever was in the city and in the field, all their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, all that was in the houses they captured and plundered. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. O Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ by the power of your Spirit who is at work in us today. And we're thankful for another Lord's Day. Help us. Help us this morning to gaze upon your glory without distraction. Help us to cling to Christ who died on that old rugged cross. Help us to see Christ as we hear your word, and so help us hear your word. Help us apply that which we hear to our lives. Enlighten our ignorant minds to your truth. Bring back those who are careless. Bring back those who are drifting away from you. Strengthen the weak. Comfort those who are suffering. And awaken in us hearts of praise and gratitude. Oh, that we would be thankful for times of peace. And that we would also be thankful for times of trouble. For we know that all things are directed by your sovereign hand. But oh, that we would be peacemakers, not troublemakers. 
because we are at peace with you, O oh God. Or ultimately, you are at peace with us. So draw us near to you this day, O oh God. Speak to us through your word. Continue the transformative work that you have begun in us. And make us more like Christ, I pray. And I pray in no other name but the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So if you've been at Providence for any significant time, any significant amount of time, I should say, um, or period of time, you know that our normal preaching diet is Lectio Continua. Now, you might say, I don't know that phrase. That's okay. It's a Latin phrase, Lectio Continua, meaning consecutive reading. So when we apply this to preaching, we essentially pick up where we left off the week before. So the steady diet here, as you know, I'm just speaking, reminding you, you know how we do this, but for those who are with us for the first time, um, I think this might be helpful. The steady diet for us to walk through books, verse by verse, and then we just pick up where we left off the last week. Now there are times where we will break for doctrinal sermons. For instance, May 7th, Tommy preached a doctrinal sermon on the Spirit's work in regeneration. So we will preach doctrinal sermons from the scriptures, but we'll also preach topical sermons. I know some of your ears are, are, are alarmed by me even saying that. We'll preach topical sermons, and one of the finest topical sermons I've ever heard was preached by Bruce Stoney back in March of 2012. He preached an expositional sermon, so expositional from the text on hospitality. That was a very encouraging an extremely convicting sermon. I would encourage you to go listen to it on Sermon Audio. So while we will break for doctrinal and topical sermons, clearly coming from Scripture, expositing the Scripture, we do that from time to time, but our steady diet is Lectio Continua. We pick up where we left off the week before. And last week's passage at the end of chapter 33, concluded with Jacob arriving safely in the city of Shechem. He is in the land of Canaan. He's finally made it to the promised land. He's finally come back to the land from which he left whenever he went for 20 years and spent with his uncle in Padan Aram. And we even see at the end of chapter 33 that he bought a piece of land from Hamor, Shechem's father. So that provides us with the backdrop for chapter 34 here. Last week, we concluded with Jacob buying, this, buying a piece of land from Shechem's father. This week, we will see Shechem defiling Jacob's daughter. And in response, we will see Jacob's sons committing genocide. As you can see on page five of your worship guide, I've divided this passage into three sections. It could easily be four, um, but I've divided it into three just to help us. The first section um, is the defilement and the proposal. This could be two sections on its own, but we see Dinah defiled by Shechem and then Shechem's proposal to marry her. Then in verses 13 through 24, we see the deceitful arrangement that Jacob's sons make with the sons of Hamor. And then in verses 25 through 31, this is actually another one that could be two parts, but we see Jacob's sons massacre an entire group of men, and then they justify themselves. There are a number of themes we could draw out from this passage. We could spend several weeks here, but we're going to spend just one, and I'm going to emphasize two themes, the seriousness of sexual sin and man's desire for justice. Those are the two that we'll draw out as we're walking through. The first one we'll look at, we'll look at the seriousness of sexual sin after we go through um, the, the first section. And then we will consider the seriousness of justice. I'm sorry, the, the man's desire for justice. So let's go ahead and dig in. Verse 1 of chapter 34. Here we see Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she bore to Jacob. She goes out to see the women of the land. Remember, at the end of 33, Jacob bought a piece of property 
It's near the city of Shechem. He's not in the city. He's near the city of Shechem. And here in verse 1, Dinah goes out from Jacob's camp to see the women of the land. Perhaps she's intrigued by the Canaanite women. All throughout the Bible, if you look, the Canaanites are wicked, evil people. And perhaps she's intrigued by their ways. We don't know for sure why she goes out, but it looks like there's a draw on her. She goes out to see the women of the land, and she goes out unchaperoned. Now, we don't know if she was allowed to go. Did she go to her father and say, hey, can I go? Um, We don't know if Jacob gave her permission or not. But what we see is she's gone out from her father's household and out from his protection. And then in verse 2, Shechem, the son of Hamor, the prince of the land, he sees her. He seizes her. He lays with her, and he humiliates her. Dinah's probably a, either a, a kind of mid-teenage, um, maybe, maybe late teen, but no more. Not an old woman. Not an older woman. A, a young girl. A young lady, possibly, goes into this land on her own. Shechem sees her, seizes her, lays with her, and humiliates her. Shechem is a well-respected man in the land. His dad is most likely the patriarch of this people. Shechem must think that he can do as he wants with whom he wants. As such, he violates Dinah, takes advantage of her, forces himself upon her. Shechem shows himself to be a true Canaanite. He shows no remorse. And as we see in verses 3 and 4, he now wants Dinah to be his wife. Shechem violated her, and now he wants her for himself. His lustful passions are drawn to Jacob's daughter, and he seeks to woo her. As we see with his tender speech at the end of verse 3, he spoke tenderly to her. Let this, all I'm going to say here is let this be a warning regarding the smooth talkers in your life. This man right here, this is a wicked man. He forced himself upon this young lady, perhaps this teenage girl, and now he's trying to smooth talk her. He's trying to flatter her. And whether his flattery works or not, we don't know. But what we do know from verse 4 is that Shechem goes to his father and he implores his father saying, get me this girl for my wife. He's already taken her by force and now he wants his father to exert influence to attain Dinah as his wife. So that's the setting for what is to come. Shechem violates Dinah and now he wants to marry her. So he asks his dad, essentially, to go and get her for him. That's not necessarily, I mean, this this is cultural for them. The dads would go and make an arrangement. So don't think that he is putting that off on his dad. But But he's violated this young woman, and now he wants to marry her. And so he says, Dad, go get me this girl for my wife. And then in verses 5 through 12, we're going to see Hamor going to Jacob and making a proposal. But before we get to the proposal, I want to look at verses 5 and 7. They provide us with some background information, some insider info, if you will. So just look at verse 5. So Jacob, he knows what's happened. He's heard that Shechem defiled his daughter Dinah. But as we see in the second half of the verse, but his sons, they're out in in the field, so he held his peace until they came. So Jacob knows what's happened. He's held his peace. And then in verse 7... We see Jacob's sons, they come in from the field as soon as they heard of it. So it looks like they found out from someone else, probably not from Jacob. And when they came in, notice, they were indignant and very angry. So look at Jacob. Jacob is peace, he's he's cool, so to speak. He holds his peace. Not the same for Jacob's sons. They are hot. They're enraged. And why? Why are they enraged? Look at the rest of verse 7. Because he, being Shechem, had done an outrageous thing in Israel 
by lying with Jacob's daughter, for such a thing must not be done. This is an abomination against them. We see very similar language in 2 Samuel 13. Amnon, who was one of David's sons, he was passionately drawn to his sister Tamar. Amnon deceptively lured Tamar, and before he violated her, this is what she said. Do not violate me, for such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do this outrageous thing. What we see here in Genesis 34 is despicable. It's outrageous. It's not to be done. And I would say even the the pagans in our land, the heathens in our land, get that. So there are times where we prefer to keep silent and not talk about sexual sin. It makes us uncomfortable. But if we read our Bible, we quickly find that the Bible is far from silent regarding sexual sin. There are numerous warnings pertaining to adultery in the Proverbs. The Mosaic law prohibited sexual immorality and prescribed the death penalty for particular sexual sins. There are commands throughout the New Testament to abstain from sexual immorality. But one of the most startling statements regarding sexual immorality is found in Revelation 21.8. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. This is a sobering reality. The sexually immoral will not only be prevented from inheriting the kingdom of God, the sexually immoral will be cast into the lake of fire. Sexual sin is not to be taken lightly. Not only because of the judgment that awaits, but because sexual sin is sin against the body. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says every other sin. So every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. And the reason this is so serious is because our bodies are made for the Lord. Therefore, sexual immorality is taking the body, the very body which was made for Christ, and you are desecrating this body, desecrating the temple. You see, if you're in Christ, then your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and sexual sin defiles the temple of the Lord Therefore, Paul exhorts us to flee from sexual immorality. So if you're in Christ, remember that your body is a temple of the Lord. And because the body is the temple of the Lord, sexual sexual immorality has no place among you. Therefore, heed Paul's exhortation and flee from all sexual immorality. Don't even give it the slightest look. Flee. Run, abstain from it. Parents, teach your children to flee from sexual immorality. Teach them in age-appropriate ways about God's design for the body and sexuality. These are truths we cannot ignore. If you don't teach them, someone will. And it'll probably be someone on social media or a peer of theirs, if you don't teach them, someone's going to teach them. Who will teach them? Will you teach them from God's word, or will you leave them to this device to find, not even find, I mean, what what are you going to find on here? You know, teach our children, teach them in age-appropriate ways about their body and about sexual immorality. We must teach our children the dangers of sexual sin but we must also teach them to be satisfied in Christ. 
John Piper points out, one reason lust reigns in so many is that Christ has so little appeal. If you have little taste for Jesus, competing pleasures will triumph. Too many professing believers are so indifferent to Christ and his glory. Too many professing Christians are not satisfied in God. Too many professing Christians are not content in Christ. And that's why we chase the lust of the flesh. We look for satisfaction in that which actually leads to death because we've lost sight of the glory of Christ. And when we no longer behold the glory of Christ, the things of this world become a whole lot more enticing. They look much more satisfying because we've forgotten how great Christ is and how deadly and soul-destroying sin is. When we struggle or when we become entangled in sexual sin, it's because we're not satisfied in God through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And if you're currently entangled by sexual sin, I exhort you to fight. Jesus, figuratively speaking, says to cut off the eye, cut out the eye, cut off the hand, because it is better to lose one of your members than to take your whole body into hell. Jesus is not saying you should literally do this. You could literally do that and still lose the the battle. Jesus is using extreme language to say, fight against the lust of the flesh. Mortify sin. Do whatever it takes to not let sin reign in your mortal bodies because you have died to sin and your life is hidden with Christ in but what if your life is not hidden with Christ in God? What about those of you who are here today who struggle with sexual sin but are not found in Christ? Just know that there is hope for you. There is hope for the sexual sinner. This does not diminish the seriousness of sexual sin. This elevates the amazingness of God's grace. Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 6, this is actually on the front of your bulletin or worship guide. I'll just read these words. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Just listen to those words. Such were some of you, but you were washed sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. The only hope for the sexual sinner is Christ. For in Him you will find forgiveness. In Him you will find cleansing. And in Him you'll be transformed into one who is fit for the kingdom of heaven. And if you're wondering, there's, you're thinking, there's no hope for me. No hope for me at all. You can just look around you and see people who fit this very reality. Anyone belonging to this church, such were some of you. Sinners, wicked sinners, enemies of God, sinning in all sorts of ways, but you were washed, sanctified, justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Thank God for his amazing grace. Much more could be said on this, but for now, let's return to our passage. So looking back, Jacob and his sons, they're aware of what's taken place. Now we see how more coming to Jacob, coming to his sons to make a proposal on behalf of Shechem. In verse 8, he asked Jacob and his sons to please give Dinah to Shechem as his wife, because Shechem's soul longs for her. 
But Hamor doesn't stop there. He sees this as an opportunity. He does not, as, this, this should, I, I, I put this here just so you'll understand the gravity. He does not denounce Shechem's act as wicked. Instead, he sees this as an opportunity. In verses 9 through 10, he lays all his cards on the table, figuratively speaking. He wants their tribes to intermarry. He wants these two tribes to live together as one. He sees this as an excellent opportunity. Remember, Jacob has greatly prospered. I mean, he has much. So there's a lot to be gained here. So Hamor makes this proposal. Give Dinah to Shechem. Give us your daughters, so your women, give us them in marriage. We'll give you our young women, our daughters in marriage, and you can dwell with us. That's the proposal. And while this might seem like a a generous offer, just look down at verse 23. Here we see Hamor's true intent. When he and Shechem stand before the men of the city, they say, will not their livestock, their property, and all their beasts be ours? Hamor is an opportunist. He sees this as a profitable transaction to make. He doesn't condemn Shechem's act. In fact, it's quite possible that he condones it. Just look at verse 27. Look at the language here. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. They, yes, I thought it was Shechem. Well, there's possibility that this they is included here to show us that this act was condoned. I would say this passage gives us insight into the wickedness of the Canaanites. They not only practice such abominations, but they give approval to those who practice such things. And here, Hamor is proposing intermarry with us. To Jacob's children, hey, we we, we will give our daughters to you, you give your daughters to us. If you've been tracking with us through the book of Genesis, you'll be aware that intermarriage comes into play quite frequently. And it's not because of ethnicity. This is, that's not the issue here. The issue is not ethnicity. The issue is immorality and idolatry. The people of God are to refrain from marrying the Canaanites, not because of their ethnicity, but because of their rampant wickedness. So you should be like, wait, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. what's going on here? Like, Jacob, surely you're going to say no to this, right? Well, we'll see. So after Hamor makes his proposal... Shechem, it's his turn to speak in verse 11. Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you say to me, I will give. Ask for me as great a bribe price and gift as you will, and I will give whatever you say to me. Only give me the young woman to be my wife. I mean, Shechem is willing to pay whatever the price is. He's willing to pay a steep price because he is so infatuated with Dinah. He wants her so badly, he'll give them whatever they want. His lust led to the defiling act, and now his lust leads him to make this proposal. Shechem wants to take Dinah as his wife, and he's willing to do whatever it takes. That brings us to the end of this first section. Now we will see the response, the deceitful arrangement that Jacob's sons make with Shechem and Hamor. Let me just point out that Jacob is not the one making this arrangement. We're not going to see Jacob speak until verse 30. He seems to have gone silent. So it's Jacob's sons who make this deal. We don't know if Jacob's in on it or not. We really aren't. Given We're not privy to that other than the fact that he held his peace until they came in. And it looks like the sons are the ones carrying out this deal. So what we see in verse 13 is the sons of Jacob answering Shechem and his father deceitfully. They're not honest. They have something up their sleeve because he had defiled their sister Dinah. They're enraged, but they're holding back their true intent, so they make this deceitful arrangement. And what do they do? They actually appeal to the covenant sign, circumcision. Back in Genesis 17, 
God told Abraham to circumcise every male in the household as a sign of the covenant that God has established with him and with his offspring after him. And here, Jacob's sons tell Shechem and Hamor that their families cannot intermarry, not because of immorality and idolatry. No, no, no. We can't intermarry with you because your males aren't circumcised. They say in verse 14 that we cannot do this thing. To give our sister to one who is uncircumcised would be a disgrace to us. Therefore, they tell Shechem in verses 15 through 17, they will give their sister away on one condition. As long as every male among you is circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you and we'll take your daughters for ourselves. So that's the deal. Circumcise every male in the city or the deal is off the table. Well, as we see in verse 18, this pleased Hamor and Hamor's son Shechem. This pleased them. I mean, as such, uh, we read that the young man in verse 19, he did not delay to do this thing because his eyes were set on Dinah because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. So he didn't delay because he's so, his eyes are so set on her. And then in verse 19 at the end, we read, now he was the most honored of all his father's house. Shechem treated Dinah with dishonor, yet he is one who is treated with honor. And because he is most honored, the men of the city, they listen to him. I mean, my understanding of this insertion is here really to show us why the men are going to listen. Well, this is someone who is highly exalted in this city. Because he and his father are about to go before the men of the city, and they're about to plead with them all to be circumcised. They begin by telling the men in verse 21, these men are at peace with us. They don't perceive any sort of deception. They're saying they're at peace with us. They're not, look, we know something bad has happened, but they seem to be over it. They're at peace. We're not at war. Nothing like that going on. And so, they then tell the men about this arrangement. And then as we read in verse 24, And all who went out of the gate of the city listened to Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of a city. They convinced them. Have this procedure done, and we will intermarry with them. We will live among them. As we see in verse 23, all their livestock, their property, and their beasts will be ours. The men of the city were so focused. Their, Their eyes are so focused on what they can gain here, they sense nothing of the deception. They don't pick up on this con because they're focused on the women and the possessions that are to be had. So every male was circumcised. And that sets us up for the final section, verses 25 through 31. It's now the third day, as we see in verse 25. The men have been circumcised, they're sore, they're recovering from surgery, so to speak. They're in no state to defend themselves, and they're not suspecting any sort of attack. Why would they? I mean, these men have come in and made an agreement with them. They're not expecting Simeon and Levi and perhaps a militia to take up swords and kill them all, as we see in verses 25 and 26. But that's what happened. Verse 26, they killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword, and then they took Dinah. Not only that, we see back in 25 that they came against the city while it felt secure and they killed all the males. They killed all the men of the city, including Hamor and Shechem. And they took Dinah, their sister, and they went away. We also see not only that, but in verse 27, they plundered the city, meaning they took what they wanted, like conquering armies would come in and take the spoils of war. They ransacked the city and took what they wanted. And why did they do this? Verse 27 at the end, because they had defiled their sister. 
This is vengeance. This is not justice. They've killed the men of the city. And as we see in verse 28 and 29, they took their livestock, their wealth, their little ones, and their wives. They came upon all the men of the city like barbarians. They killed all the men. They took what they wanted. And in response to this, Jacob says to Simeon and Levi in verse 30, you've brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. This is the first time Jacob speaks in this passage. He said nothing about his daughter being sexually assaulted. He said nothing in the negotiations, but now he speaks to his reputation among the Canaanites. He's concerned with how he will be perceived among the people, and he's worried they'll retaliate against him. To which his sons respond, verse 31, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? Jacob cares about his reputation. His sons care about Dinah's honor. By no means am I approving their violent crime. But this does show the difference between Jacob and his sons. Jacob has been passive while his sons zealously brought reproach upon the family in defense of their sister. Jacob says nothing while his sons go to the extreme. Jacob's passivity opened the door for his son's misguided zeal. Jacob's sons need him to set the example here. They need him to teach them in righteousness. I mean, that was what God told Abraham back in Genesis 18, that you will command your children to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. So Jacob, that would, he would be a, a, a beneficiary of that, to keep passing that along. So Jacob's sons need him to bridle their zealousness. They have a zeal without knowledge. And their zeal to restore their sister's honor brought reproach upon the entire family. Younger men need older men to bridle their zeal. Older men need younger men to remind them of the zeal for life you once had when you were a younger man. On just a side note, it infuriates me when I see churches splitting based on music styles, effectively separating the young and the old when we need one another. And we're reminded of that here in Genesis 34. Jacob's sons need him to step up, but he didn't. And now out of their zeal, they brought reproach upon Jacob and his entire household. While Jacob's concern is for his reputation, he does have a point. This is not good for his household. His sons have made him stink. They've made him a stench among the peoples of the lands. They should be a people of peace. Yet now they've shown themselves to be a people of murderous rage. So out of their desire for justice, they've shown themselves to be vengeful. As one commentator notes, the recompense that Dinah's brothers considered appropriate was the forfeiture of land, I'm sorry, of life and goods of the entire city. While this punishment, the punishment given by Simeon and Levi and perhaps a militia, this punishment is not proportionate to the crime. But while that is so, we cannot deny that Jacob's sons, they want justice. They're partial and unjust. Nonetheless, they want justice. But why do they want justice? Because a wrong has been done. Well, how do they know a wrong has been done? Because at this point in history, the law of Moses has not yet been given. Yet they still knew this to be a grievous violation of their sister. The law of Moses will call for the death penalty in cases like this, but the law of Moses has not yet been given. So how does Simeon and Levi know this is a detestable thing? 
natural law. Paul says in Romans 2, those who do not have the law show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. Without the law of Moses, Simeon and Levi knew this was a detestable thing. And even though they act in vengeance, we still see their desire for justice. This is evidence of natural law. Some will call this... So, if you were in Tommy's Sunday school class last week, you would have heard R.C. Sproul say that natural law reflects the eternal law. But here's the trouble with natural law. While God's law is written on our hearts, we are depraved sinners who reject God and his law. This is why we need the Spirit of God to regenerate our hearts, to know and to love God's law. Everyone knows God's moral requirements. Yet apart from the work of God in our hearts, we all show ourselves to be unrighteous. And so here with Jacob's sons, they show themselves to be possessors of natural law because of their sense of justice, yet they also show themselves to be depraved sinners in the way that they execute this justice. While their desire for justice is good, their deception and vengeance actually undercuts justice. Taking justice into their own hands, they show what is truly in their hearts. What Shechem did was wrong. His offense was worthy of punishment. But Simeon and Levi did not bring forth justice. They brought forth vengeance showing themselves to be deceptive, murderous, wicked, and evil men. I mean, just think about what they did. They used the sign of the covenant, the sign of the covenant that God had established with Abraham and his offspring. They take that sign and they use it deceptively. Alan Ross, he writes this, the covenant was not a ploy to be dangled in deception before the pagans. The son's instinct for justice was correct, but their methods were ruthless and excessive. Their deception and vengeance actually undercuts justice. Therefore, this was not justice, this was murder. So returning to that notion of natural law, the common notions, so to speak, that all men have, we can say along with Paul in Romans that it does nothing more than condemn fallen man. This does not mean that natural law is fallible. Man is fallible. Man is sinful. What can be known about God is plain because God has shown it to natural man. But natural man rejects God. Natural man rejects God's rules and says, I know best. Natural man says, I will determine what's best for me. And we can see the outworking of this today in our culture. We live in a land that is becoming less and less restrained because we are becoming more and more resistant to God. And in the midst of this, we've been experiencing an epidemic of anxiety and depression. We're one of the most prosperous nations throughout all the history of the world, yet the suicide rates have been on the rise since 2000. When man thinks he knows best, This does not lead to the good life. This exposes what is in man. And that's nothing but dirty, rotten filth. And that's what we see here in chapter 34. We see dirty, rotten filth and its unrighteous justification. Simeon and Levi, they justify their wickedness in the name of justice. While they want justice, they exact vengeance. Yet vengeance is not theirs to repay. God says in his word, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Simeon and Levi have taken something that does not belong to them as if it was theirs to give. 
And as a result, instead of exercising justice, they murder an entire group of people. In their unbridled zeal, they brought reproach upon their father's household. So what we have here in Genesis 34 is a passage from God's word that provides us with a glimpse into the depths of our depravity. Jacob sought to be at peace through his passivity, which opened the door for his sons to exact vengeance. They deceived Shechem and the people, and they set them up for slaughter. But don't feel sorry for Shechem and his people. A wrong was done to them, but Shechem is a rapist. This people are most likely culpable. They see no wrong done. And along with Hamor and Shechem, the people are greedy and covetous. They will undergo the covenant sign to gain women and wealth. It doesn't justify what happened to them, but the Canaanites are not a good people. It's not as though good people, innocent people have been slain here. Because as we know from Scripture, no one is good, no one is righteous, no, not one. And what we're reminded of here, we're reminded of that truth. We're reminded of what the world is like apart from God. We see what man is like apart from God. In fact, there's no mention of God in this passage. But passages like this are not to leave us without hope. Passages like this cry out for the righteousness of God. Passages like this remind us that apart from Christ, no one is righteous, no, not one. Even when we desire that which is right, we find that all our righteous deeds are like polluted garments. As such, passages like this remind us that Jacob and his sons are not the ones to bring blessing upon the earth. Remember God's promise that's been reiterated all throughout the book of Genesis. He told Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So far, the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are a far cry from that promise. Instead of bringing blessing, they brought curse. And that reminds us that this blessing will come from another. This blessing will come from one who is truly righteous. This blessing will come from one who is not wicked like the sons of Jacob and the sons of Hamor. This blessing will come from one who is powerful and willing, not from one who is passive like Jacob. This one, as we know, is none other than Jesus Christ. During his first coming... He laid down his life sacrificially to forgive the sins of his children. In his second coming, he will exact vengeance upon all unrighteousness. And when he returns, no one, and I mean no one, will be able to stay his hand. No one will be able to stand before him. For none are righteous. Therefore, your only hope is to be found in him. Your only hope is to trust in Him, to run to Him for refuge. In Him there is rest. In Him there is peace. For He absorbed the justice of God in your place. And in Him you will be saved from the day of wrath when God will justly deal with all the ungodly and all the unrighteous. So while it is good and right to desire justice. Just remember that apart from Christ, you don't want justice. You want mercy. And if you're in Christ, you're a recipient of such amazing grace and mercy. God owes you nothing more than the fierce hand of judgment, yet his wrath has been stayed against you because of Jesus Christ. And in this way, God shows himself to be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So while Genesis 34 teaches us about the wickedness of man, it also reminds us of God's electing grace. God did not choose Jacob and his family because of their righteousness. For they are no different than the pagans of the land. He chose them to make known the riches of his mercy and grace. 
And the same applies for us today. We too were once dead in our trespasses and sins. We were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he's made us alive together with Christ. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. As J.C. Ryle wrote, there is a remedy revealed for man's need as wide and broad and deep as man's disease. Aren't you thankful for God's mercy and grace? And if you're not currently a recipient of God's mercy and grace, look to him and be saved. God is a merciful God. He will not turn away any who come to him for pardon. He will receive you unto himself. He will pardon all who come to him and confess him as Lord and believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. He is not a God who says, you know what, let me, let me look. What have you done? What have you done? No, God will pardon you in Christ Jesus because he's done the work that you could not. Your sins, no matter how terrible you might think they are, Christ is greater than all of your sin. Be thankful for God and his mercy, and his grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and I pray that we would be reminded from a passage like this that apart from you, we are all sick and twisted. Not one of us can stand here with pride and say, I'm better than him or better than her. All of us are destitute apart from you. We all need Christ. I pray that you would transform us to be like Christ. Work in our lives that we might be repulsed by sin, by the sin in our lives. We'd be repulsed by it and fight against it. I pray that we would not come here because we think we're righteous. We come here knowing we need help. And we need more than man's help. We need you, O oh God. We need your spirit working within us. And even then, on that last day, we will not stand before you because of what we've become. We'll stand before you because of Christ, who is at work in us. Help us to cling to Christ who died on that old rugged cross. Help us to rejoice, to live the life that you have called us unto. You've said we've been made alive in Christ. Help us to live that life, to, not, to stop going back to the ways of our old man, the ways of sin and death. Help us to walk the way that leads to life and peace in your spirit. Help us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. So at this time, if you'll stand for the benediction. It's from Romans 15, 5 and 6. I'll read this and then you'll be dismissed. So may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.